Hello art friends, my name is Fleshwad, and today, I have a creepypasta for you. This one isn't really set in Halloween, but it does mention Halloween and it is a very good creepypasta. The creator also did draw art for this creepypasta which I will show at the end. Make sure to watch this video in the dark, with the lights off and your headphones on, for the best viewing experience. Lucian or Lulu, Phoenix Spirit, submitted by you slash Ozzy underscore Blue Jay. As young children, we fantasize that nothing can touch us, that our parents are invincible, and can protect us from everything that would ever dare to hurt us. Of course, those are lies concocted by young minds. I figured that out too late. Typing this out, I'm watching the home I spent most of my youth in burn to the ground, surrounded by cops, ambulances and sirens, shaking in a stranger's clothes that are far too large for me. I feel no remorse, no pain, no sadness. All I feel is anger. I wasn't the one to set this hell on earth ablaze. This wasn't my home, it was my prison. Going back around 15 years, my six-year-old self begged my parents to take me to the park. Having both parents at home was a luxury for me that I remember. Dad was a counselor at a summer camp, and mom was a pharmacist at our local pharmacy. Being their only child, and a lucky little boy, they agreed, and we started our venture. I didn't know that would be my last day seeing them. The park was roughly 10 minutes from our house, allowing our neighbors to meander alongside us for a small chat. Being the little snot I was, I took advantage of my parents' distraction and made a beeline for the park swing set that resided behind a line of trees and acted as a fence. I remember being ecstatic that I was the first child to the swing set and having first pick. As I climbed into the swing, tucking my knees onto the seat, I noticed a little blonde girl shuffling nervously to the swing next to mine. Hey, I said rather sharply as I didn't like the thought of another kid, especially a girl, taking the swing next to me. I'm saving that. She blinked at me, her pigtails shifting in the wind. For who? My dad. I huffed. I knew this girl. I had seen her in the church parking lot with her family every Sunday. I had never been to church, never interacted with this girl until then. But that hadn't stopped me before. Despite my single protest, the girl plopped herself on the swing with all the grace a seven-year-old could muster. She smiled, as if she bested me at my little mind game. I crossed my arms and pouted. Do you want to get married? Her question caught me off guard. Married? That was for adults like my parents. Besides, I didn't want that. My face must have portrayed my discontent, because hers turned sour. You can't say no. I already told my mom and dad I wanted to marry you. I opened my mouth to protest with the beginnings of a fit when someone grabbed me from behind. I didn't have to be a genius to figure out I was being kidnapped in the broad daylight, but the knowledge didn't bring me any sense of relief. I kicked and squirmed, screaming under this person's hand and looking around frantically. I managed to see my father jumping over fences with the other neighborhood dads, the mothers screaming frantically, stumbling after their husbands, as I was shoved in the back of a van. That's the last memory I have of my parents. So began my new life in hell, as soon as I arrived at the house on the corner of Loan and Reese, surrounded by a white picket fence. My training began. I was thrown into the basement and promptly slapped across the face. Listen, son, you're gonna marry our little princess once you hit 20. Our church believes the woman chooses, 
and you're gonna stay right here so you don't run away. I screamed at him that my parents would find me, that my whole neighborhood was looking for me and would take him to jail. I fully believed it, and screamed with my whole tiny body, throwing a fit only a six-year-old could achieve. All that earned me was another hard slap across the face, and being locked in the dark after my captor stormed up the stairs. I cried that night, sobs that shook my whole body, and wet the knees of my little jeans. I was beyond terrified, as the night continued, completely oblivious to how long this hell would actually last. I continued to grow in that basement, spent every birthday shackled to the wall, aimlessly wandering in circles, listening to the chain links tug and clank against each other with every step. My hair started to fade from its brunette fluff to a mane of white hair caused by the stress and lack of sunlight I received. I grew thin, outgrew my clothes, lost pigment, and squinted at even the slightest bit of light that seeped through the basement door. Once I turned nine, the Johnsons decided I was old and scared enough for them to bring me around to the church. Tammy, my captor's wife, trimmed my hair as it was too girly for them. Vincent threw me some of his old clothes that hung loosely on my skin and bone frame, and Annie spun a fantasy-filled tale of taking in a boy of the street to be her betrothed. I was forced to wear brown contacts and answer to the name Lucas. If I didn't, I knew I'd be punished, and that proved to be true. The church was full of people, none of which I knew. They followed the pastor in prayer, song, and finally a half-hearted announcement about a missing Lucian Akrij. I broke during that session and cried until I was shoved into the basement and slammed down there without meals. My parents were still searching for me, and that kept me going for years on end. Year after year, I fought against these people, shouting, hitting, bleeding, and biting after every sermon we returned from. At age 12, Halloween night, I decided to run. Annie skipped along the sidewalk in her fairy costume, her parents beaming with joy as I trudged along next to them. Upon reaching a crowd of children, I ducked into ranks, speeding as fast as my tired legs could take me, until I reached a house surrounded by carved pumpkins. I knocked and started rocking on my heels anxiously, waiting until the old man opened the door, donning the signature fake star of a police costume. Call the cops, please. I begged him, clasping my hands together. I don't know these people. They took me from my family. The old man raised his brows as Vincent walked up to me with a laugh. <laughs> Sorry there, sir. Kiddo's got an active imagination. Took him out of foster care for our daughter. Infatuated with him, she is. To my horror, the old man nodded and laughed with his whole belly. Boy should be an actor. Had me for a second. He broke off into a chuckle and placed a chocolate bar in my shaking hands. For the rest of the night, I was tugged by Tammy, a rope tied around my waist. If anything was brought up about my costume, the Johnsons would laugh and say I was a peasant's boy. If pressed further, they would say it was a school-inspired costume. No one pressed further than that. I was beat bloody and bruised that night. My voice gave out an hour in. The next few weeks, I wasn't allowed any form of food because of my escape attempt. I lived off of the ant and stray bugs that found their way into the basement through the cracks in the cement. My ankles had been rubbed raw from these shackles long ago, so I never felt when the blisters burst or something started bleeding. Nothing ever changed for me. At 15, my world crashed around me. Vincent came into the basement grabbed my hair and sneered into my swollen face that my mother had died. I didn't believe him, and continued to stare as he dragged me upstairs and shoved a suit and my contacts into my hands, telling me to be ready in ten minutes. 
several layers of makeup, a suit, and 20 minutes of driving later, I was staring at my mother's corpse in a casket. She was still beautiful. Her long brown hair pulled into a braid with flowers placed lovingly in the hair tie. I couldn't speak, nor think, as I reached down to feel the dress she was wearing. It was a cotton dress, white with yellow flowers and an open back. She loved wearing it in spring, with a big floppy brimmed hat. My father and I got this dress for her 27th birthday. That was two years before I was kidnapped. I didn't realize I was crying until the silent tears started slipping out of my eyes and down my face until they slid onto my neck. I found out from a kind coworker of my mom's that she died of a heart attack. The search for her precious little boy put so much stress on her that she dropped at work and never woke again. I didn't sleep that night. A bit of me was buried along with my mother. At least the Johnsons were kind enough to let me say goodbye. Two years later, my father followed his beloved wife into the clouds. The Johnsons pulled the same song and dance, bringing me up from the basement to my father's funeral. He had drowned, saving a missing child from a strong river's current. It must have been his last act of trying to get his child, me, back. That night, I sobbed harder than I ever did in my life. Heavy body-shaking sobs that came heaving from my stomach. I definitely pulled a few muscles and misplaced a rib or two, but I didn't care. I screamed and cried until my voice cut out and my throat was raw, bile rising into my throat until it spewed onto the floor in front of me. I vowed I'd get the Johnsons back that night. I promised my parents in a silent prayer that I'd make them pay. I didn't eat for a few days after that, while I grieved. Not that Vincent and Tammy seemed to mind. Annie, however, tried to get me to eat small morsels of her leftovers. I don't want an ugly, skinny husband. She had scoffed, shoving a piece of half-eaten cornbread at me. At 18, things changed, aiming at the better. Tammy purchased a puppy for Annie, one that would stay in the basement with me at night. They were hoping he would attack me if I was covered in blood and smelt of food. So they threw my food down the stairs from then on, and beat me more than usual until I bled, so profusely, I almost blacked out. The puppy, however, a little blue and white pit bull named Chester, was far from a bloodthirsty creature. He snuggled me to keep me warm at night, licked my wounds clean despite my protest, and let me cry into his fur when I missed my parents. Chester was the best thing to happen in that house. But as always, the Johnsons caught on a few weeks later and started keeping him in the house. Once again, I was alone. Everything came to a close the week after my 21st birthday. That entire week, I listened to the footsteps above, the water dripping from a leaky pipe in the corner of the basement, and the scurrying rats seeking shelter from the thunderstorm outside. The day I escaped, I was staring at the chains and support beams, measuring everything carefully and sincerely contemplating ending it right there. I'll do it tonight, I said to myself, experimentally wrapping the length of the chain around my neck so they can listen to my blue corpse swaying and making the floors creak. I prepared all day, fully ready to do the deed and join my parents that night. I didn't even know what time it was by the time I climbed onto the support beams of the basement, hoisting up the chain when I heard it. I didn't know what it was at first, and tilted my head to press my ear up to the ceiling. A new set of footprints? That wasn't possible. Guests weren't allowed in the house. It was too likely that I could be found. It felt like only a second before the screaming started. First in the upstairs bedroom, then in the downstairs bathroom, and finally in the kitchen, the screams of fear and pain. As guilty as it made me, 
They were absolutely beautiful to my ears. I could only imagine the blood flowing down their necks and splashing onto their faces as they were mangled and mutilated by this strange intruder. I found myself laughing. I found myself laughing, cackling with my whole chest as I fell off the rafters onto the cold ground. As my ecstasy at the thought of the Johnsons ran dry, I found myself suddenly with company in the dingy old basement, an older man, hatchet in one hand, bowl of stew in the other, stood in complete shock at the top of the stairs. Hey, I smiled, throat dry and cracking. Wanna share that with me? The man's name was Spencer O'Neill. He unlocked my chains, brought me upstairs and gave me a change of clothes to put on as he stole another bowl of stew for me. While the outfit was a bit big, the navy shirt was a size too big. The green overalls hung below my feet to the point I had to roll them up. And the shoes were a mix of two types, sewn together as a slip-on. It was comfier and warmer than the rags I had to wear before. Spencer and I sat and mumbled a conversation around the stew we ravenously dug into. It turned out Vincent owed him money and skipped on the payment for years, which is why the Johnson family lay bleeding dry in their own home. I nodded and fed Chester, who Spencer luckily left alone. Pieces of cubed beef from my stew. It felt so surreal to be sitting at a table again, eating a real hot meal. And when Spencer pulled out a box of matches, things only got better. The match was struck, and I watched the flames dance between Spencer's fingertips. It had been years since I watched the beautiful flames flicker and pop, the warmth and the beauty enraptured me. As I followed Spencer outside with Chester, oblivious to the oil coating the ground beneath my feet, I couldn't help it, like a moth to the flame. I had to follow. I watched in bliss as Spencer flicked the match into the oil, igniting the house in a gorgeous bonfire that raged against the night sky, despite the onslaught of rain. It was breathtaking. Spencer chuckled and threw an extra shirt over me. Stay dry, kid. I'll be seeing you someday. Now I sit, watching the glorious flames being extinguished. A gas mask newly placed on my face to prevent further smoke inhalation. I know that cult needs to be exterminated, decimated, and destroyed. So I made up my mind. I shall leave this place and visit my parents, seeking some form of forgiveness for what I'll do. Like a phoenix, I rise from the ashes of my prison, only to bring others to their fiery tombs. And that is the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed. Like I mentioned earlier, Ozzy underscore Blue Jay did create their own art for this character. So here's their art. I unfortunately did not get to draw Chester, but he is so cute. I love that you added him into your character sheet. And I also love that you used a box of matches as your color palette. I think that is so creative. I hope you like my fan art of your character and thank you so much for commenting your story and letting me read it on my channel, I really appreciate it. If you like the story and you like the art, please make sure to like the video and subscribe if you haven't. Leave a creepy comment down below, tell me how is your October going so far. I can't believe it's almost over. Thank you so so much for watching art friends. Until the next video. Bye.